Hi everyone, um, this is Robert Murphy here, and um, I'll be doing the content for this month. I've got a nice slideshow prepared for you that I'm recording um, here on my computer. And hopefully uh, most of you uh, were at the Friday Advanced Neuro ELT session that we had at Fab Five. I'll be talking about uh, or revisiting a lot of those points. And uh, I remember you really enjoyed talking about those, uh, those questions. So we're going to go back to those questions and then look at a lot of the jargon that I had discussed that night. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. And um, all of this content is going to be put up on the forum as well. So this is going to be a great place to explore these concepts in detail. Now that we're back from the conference, we're back at our regular jobs, and uh, we've had a, many weeks, actually months, uh, of time since we first explored these. And so I'm sure your hippocampus has been working on these while you had ample sleep at night. Um, so the insights that you'll have and the stuff you'll be able to bring to the table, or I should say to the forum, uh, should be significantly different from uh, your initial responses. And I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, all kinds of feedback from you regarding these things. Um, so let's look at uh, what we're looking at uh, this month. The key neural ELT concepts that uh, I brought on that Friday uh, were CREAM, Teaching for the DATC, uh, DANS, and then Skill Theory. So I'm going to be revisiting all four of these uh, here today. And then, of course, the deep questions that you enjoyed so much uh, discussing that night. Uh, we're going to be looking at them again. And uh, while we look at those questions, I'd like you to choose a few that you'd like to explore on the forum. Of course, uh, if you want to do all of them on the forum, you know, you go with bananas and write about all of them, sure, by all means, please do. Uh, but uh, that is totally optional. Um, I'm expecting maybe two or three uh, per person, though. Uh, uh, tackling all of them is going to be extremely time-consuming, but, you know, uh, it's very, f it's fun. So, uh, you know, if you have time and the inclination, yeah, by all means, go for all of them. But uh, <laughs> we're expecting you on this course to, to get to about three of them, okay? So, uh, the first acronym that we looked at was CREAM. Now CREAM stands for Consciousness Raising, Emotions Analysis, Manipulation, and Expansion. Um, and it's an acronym that I came up with uh, almost 10 years ago um, for a way to teach, uh, or I should say uh, an advanced style of pedagogy that is based on neuro ELT principles. Now the first part, consciousness raising, as I hope you remember, is about priming the students, okay? Getting them aware of what is to come. And that's extremely important and uh, it's overlooked by many teachers. Uh, it's the foundation of the high support context, isn't it? Um, it could be some simple questions that you throw out at the students or have them look at some artwork that would somehow relate to the content um, or getting them to interact, you know, um, with each other, ask, having them ask questions to each other about the content of the day. Okay, we start off with consciousness raising um, and then move into emotions analysis, getting the students to think about how they feel about that content. Um, it could be as simple as putting emotional valences next to the, the words that they'll be using that day. Um, it could be more detailed, uh, having them write a little paragraph or even a sentence um, about how they feel about that topic. Anything that gets, their, um, gets them aware about their emotions and then kind of analyzing them okay, is uh, very important also at the beginning. Uh, once they've gone through those two stages, then the next part is manipulation. And that is to take the content and um, 
personalize it, you know, get it into a new design that fits within their own thinking better. Okay. Now they've already done the conscious raising, they've already done the emotions analysis. So this manipulation part is much easier than if you had just started off with the manipulation part. Okay. So it could be something like um, there's a passage and you have them rewrite the passage. Um, there, there are all kinds of ways of, of going at this part. Um, but it's the personalization that really makes it real for them. And so this is a part that we cannot skip. It's, it certainly uh, should be an integral part of any kind of teaching. And finally, the expansion part is letting the students be creative with the content. Um, let them go further. Okay, Let them take the content and put it uh, have them imagine different situations um, and uh, put it in different contexts and make it real for them. Okay, um, so that's cream, and we'll come back to that later, um, uh, and I'll show you specifically how I use cream uh, in my own textbook designs. Um, but yeah, I'd like you to keep that in mind as we move on to the next acronym, which is DATC. Okay, uh, or more specifically, teaching for the DATC. DATC stands for Dynamic Area of Total Convergence. And what are we talking about here? We're talking about the different networks uh, in the brain. Um, you know, the neuromyth says that we only use 10% of the brain. Of course, that's hogwash. We use the whole uh, brain. If we didn't if we didn't use 90% of the brain, that 90% of the brain would atrophy and, you know, it would wither away and, and disappear. So um, that's just total nonsense. We do use 100% of the brain, um, but we don't use 100% of the brain at every second. You know, we're, we're switching back and forth between all kinds of different uh, um, neural networks. Now, in a language class, because it's so focused on language learning, we often forget to engage the other networks that are available to us uh, in real life situations. Okay, so teaching for the DATC is a way to engage the rest of the brain um, in a way that is more naturalistic to real world language learning. So you see these three circles I have here. One is uh, the pink area here language, the linguistic structures, this is the type of stuff that, yeah, we actually do focus on in the classroom most of the time. The lexis, you know, um, the phrases, the grammar points, things like that, when we focus top-down on these linguistic structures. Um, but we cannot just only focus on that and expect the students to go out in the real world and use them properly. Um, it just doesn't work that way, and it's... and. Um, for my 20 some odd years of teaching in Japan, it's quite painfully obvious that focusing on only linguistic structures has not uh, significantly improved the average Japanese person's uh, English capabilities, even after six to eight to 12 years of uh, learning, okay, throughout public schooling and university English lessons. So uh, what else uh, should we add to this equation? Well, we have these two other circles here. One is emotion um, and cognition. These are the nonverbal manifestations, the emotional manifestations uh, that grow with language uh, in the L1 specifically, um, if, if we want to make it easier to, to, uh, to, uh, to understand. So imagine things that you learned in the L1. So uh, imagine words like... Uh, Maybe you learned the word fire, okay, if, if English is your um, L1. Let's imagine English is your L1, okay? And it's, when you learn the word fire, uh, you might have some cool images that connected to that, but you might have been burned once or twice, okay? Maybe there's a firecracker or your hand was too close to the kitchen, uh, you know, the burner, and maybe you got a little burn on your finger, or maybe there was some sort of a... I don't know, uh, maybe there's a lighter near you and you didn't know what you're doing and you're really young and then you kind of burnt your finger. All these emotional responses uh, 
kind of tied in with that word fire. So when you hear the word fire and ask you to think about the emotions related to that, then you have a whole slew of emotions that connect to it in the L1. Now the problem is, if you're learning an L2 or say an L3 or, or any other language, um, and you're asked to tie in uh, your emotions, you would probably have to go to memories related to your L1, that is your first language, and dig up stories that you had and kind of translate them back. And in that case, what's happening is that they're just translations that are hooking up to your L2 or L3, and it's not real emotion. Uh, it's um, kind of a translated over emotion, okay? And it's not very authentic, is it? The response that your body will show is sort of a simulated response and not a native-like response to that. And that's an interesting phenomenon that we as teachers have to realize is a reality. So what we want to do is have the students in situations where they create emotional responses to the L2 input and output um, that are not directly from the L1, but are responsible and, and um, connected to somehow the L2 in a more native-like way. Okay, And um, one interesting way of accomplishing that is through gestures. Now, um, I don't want to be so Japan-centric, but because I've been teaching Japan so long, uh, let me just touch on that a bit. Like in the classroom, Japanese students and Japanese teachers have certain expectations about how Americans will react to certain situations um, that are quite different than Japanese typical mannerisms. And, uh, um, and there's this concept of the so-called American joke and, and, uh, and how Americans are, are supposed to react. Okay, now, so they have a part of them uh, that sort of realizes that the reality there, that emotional responses and gestures are different in another country. So we can tap into that and then try to go over appropriate gestures and non-appropriate gestures, okay? That's, that's one way of, of going about it. Another way um, is to actually watch perhaps videos, which would be much more authentic um, if you <laughs> choose appropriately. Like, you know, a, a movie um, that's emotional. It could be a funny movie or a movie that makes you cry. Having the students watch these movies or, or snippets of dramas and uh, asking them to discuss what kind of emotions were there, what kind of gestures they saw can, uh, can really help in this. Okay, And, uh, of course, the discussion, if you could uh, have the discussion in English, or whatever the, the target language is, is, uh, is much better than having to translate it over. And then now the last part, the screen circle here, is uh, the sociocultural manifestations. That is, you know, the, the rights and wrongs of a culture. What is accepted? What is not accepted? And it's hard for students here in Japan to understand what culture is when I first put it on the table. Because what they typically think of culture here in Japan is stuff from the past. They translate it to the word called bunka. And a bunka, although it does really mean the same thing in, in English, what they think of is tea ceremony and samurai and um, Japanese-style calligraphy and things like that. And, you know, they don't think of day-to-day -day activities, you know, they don't think that culture is something that guides how they live their own lives. They think it's old stuff that you have to go learn. So the first thing I do is kind of break it down and say, yes, we have old culture that we can study as, you know, as we study history. But in reality, culture is what sort of guides us, uh, the guidelines of our society are um, based on culture, or, and it goes hand in hand. I mean, what society does 
it, it creates culture and culture creates society. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. This is why I have this hyphen between us. I'm calling the sociocultural manifestations. And after I start discussing that, you know, if you were watching this program on Saturday night at 6.30 every week, okay, that becomes part of your culture, it's part of your family culture. And most, if most of Japan watches that same program, then you go to school the next day and, you know, or go to work the next day and you can talk about that program. Well, yeah, those uh, interesting side effects come from these uh, uh, sociocultural events. So it's not necessarily something that you have to study. It's actually some, it's the way you live your life that we're talking about. So um, as you can see now, all of this is connected to language and it's much more deeper and much more profound than just picking up Lexis and translating things over. And uh, for our brains to understand uh, these nonverbal manifestations of an L2, and the social culture manifestations of an L2, it's not just an intellectual experience. It should be a holistic immersion. Um, and put in that light, the teacher's responsibility, the responsibility overall, this is uh, it's quite enormous, actually. It could be a daunting task, but it's important to realize that we should be covering all three of these. And this is why I, I call for you know teaching for the DATC. DAT stands for Dynamic Area of Total Convergence, the total convergence of all three of these areas uh, that should be covered, you know, specifically, um, hopefully, in the classroom and outside of the classroom. If you can create situations where the student can, you know, visit a country that uses the target language um, or you create uh, some sort of programs where they can meet up with people from that use that language um, well and can sh demonstrate for the students uh, the range of emotions that match the language usage and uh, the social cultural manifestations that match that language to create this uh, this large DATC you see the the overlap here within the three circles okay that area there uh, that this red arrow is pointing to, we should have a large convergence area here. The larger, the better. Okay. Now, if you're a native L1 speaker, then basically the overlap is huge, much larger than we have here. Okay. And that's what we're looking. Uh, that should be uh, one of the goals to create a much larger DATC than our current students have. Okay. So that's talking about the DATC. Now, one way of doing that. And making the students learning uh, visible to you is to uh, create uh, a map like this or actually you can um, copy this and take a screenshot of this if you'd like and uh, give it to your students and uh, to make their learning visible uh, to make sure they're getting all of these connections what you do is you take um, any concept that you've been teaching and uh, have them write that in the center circle of any of these. Well, actually, probably we should start on the top left circle, the linguistic connections, okay? Have them write their main word there in the center and then come up with lexical items, okay? Phrases and or words that uh, linguistically connect and make sense um, logically. Um, so they basically they create a large library of lexical items, okay? And that satisfies the typical language classroom uh, area, perhaps, okay? Uh, they, they have this uh, library of connections to that word. Now, on the right, top right side, we have feelings and emotional connections. They write that same uh, main word in the center, and then think about how that would and they think about different situations where that uh, word or concept would come into play and then they write up all these ranges of emotional words uh, that they can imagine uh, from the different contexts okay and uh, of course the larger the better now the second or third tier connections they might not even be emotional words anymore but if they were born from thinking about emotional content then that's fine 
let them explore. Um, and then that's just making their, you know, their neural networks upstairs that much larger. So that's fine. Uh, now the bottom center one, social culture connections, again, they write that uh, main word in the center. And then uh, from there, you ask them to think about different contexts and, and how they can bring in a cultural or social um, affects, um, you know, things that happen in daily life. How, how basically, they're, you're asking them to relate the concept to reality as they see it um, within the context of that L2. And it might be hard at the beginning for some of them, and some of the students might take to it very quickly. Just help them along. And, uh, and some of them get stuck. Just remind them that the social aspect can be um, about big business. And once you say big business, it really clicks really quickly. It goes, oh, they can always think of, they go, oh, yeah, they can always think of a business that connects somehow. Okay, they can think of a business name. And from there, you know, uh, that's a big aha moment for them. And they should be able to connect all kinds of businesses. Now, you don't want this whole thing to be a business-centric, but that should start uh, a, a nice cascade. Uh, and then you can start bringing in culture, like uh, how, how does um, music relate to this? Or uh, do you know any animations or any movies that come into play? And, you know, it... Once you get them started, and yeah, it shouldn't take that long. Uh, the second time, the third time they work on this paper, the faster they get. I will guarantee that. Okay. And the greatest thing about having this, having them do this, uh, for from the teacher's perspective, is you can gauge, you can assess their actual learning. Okay. And um, if there's very little going on on the paper, then you know you have to just keep working on it. Um, and then you can have them look at this paper and create paragraphs or reports, uh, you know, mini presentations on this content. And that's a great way to assess their learning as well, to make sure you've covered all three bases. Okay. So this is a very uh, neat way to teach for the DATC and assess, make their learning visible. Now the next um, part I want to talk about, uh, the next acronym I want to talk about is DAN. Now this is another term uh, or acronym that I've coined. It stands for Dynamic Acquisition Equilibrium Network. Now that's a mouthful, but I feel this is a very, very important acronym. In short, it takes the place of what we typically just call neural networks. But for me, I had the hardest time with this term neural network, not because I didn't understand it, but when I discussed neural networks with people, most people seem to take the meaning um, a little too, what should I say, um, lightly. They didn't see the depth of the word. And it's not their fault. Neural network just doesn't convey the reality of what's going on in the brain. So I figured, well, we need a better term for that. And so I started off here with the D, the dynamic part. Now, you know, dynamic means something that's changing. Uh, it's always in flux, okay? Now, when you hear the word neural network, it doesn't sound like it, anything's fluctuating, right? So we're already starting off on the wrong foot when we're just saying neural network. So yeah, I threw the word in dynamic at the front, and I really think it deserves to be there. Um, every moment of every second, your brain is changing. While you're listening to this content, um, your brain is changing, okay? Uh, if I tell you um, your breathing uh, is a little awkward or something like that, and then you start thinking about, hmm, is my breathing really awkward? And then uh, you're probably thinking about your breathing right now, and that might be affecting you. Um, and then it's it's making it harder for you to concentrate on this content. So in this way, um, I've affected you dynamically, okay? Um, it's not concrete at all, but please try to forget about your breathing. <laughs> I apologize. I've made it worse by saying that. Um, 
Okay, the next part is acquisition. Acquisition, I hyphenate it now, um, dynamic acquisition equilibrium network, but let's just focus on the acquisition part. Um, in this case, acquisition is about how the brain is always trying to get information, uh, good information from around us. Okay, A nice metaphor would be like, garden plants. You know, plants desire sunlight. They reach out and try to get as much sunlight as they can, and that's their source of energy, right? As a metaphor, that works pretty, you know, pretty well with the brain. The, the networks in the brain are there. Um, they don't store everything that comes up, okay? As you probably recall, the RAS, the reticular ancillary system, filters out the majority of the information that comes in. Still, the main purpose of the brain is to uh, acquire information. Um, it's acquiring in important information, stimulus from uh, around us, stimuli from around us. Now, I added the word equilibrium into this acronym because our brains, although they're acquiring information, they're also trying to make sense of the world by balancing our personal needs with what is around us. So it's very important to have this equilibrium word in there. Our whole universe is about waves and frequencies and how they balance out each other, okay? And how they balance each other out. And it's no different between our existence and the rest of the world, our personal existence and the rest of the world. Our brains pick up information, assess our body's problems or uh, the, the current state of our bodies, right? And then uh, it sort of analyzes what it can from, from the outside and tries to balance the two, okay? simple explanation is if you walk outside the door and you realize it's cold your body starts shivering and you and you know you realize oh wow it is cold maybe i should go get a jacket uh, and then you go get your jacket you put it on and then yeah this is how your body solves the problem there's equilibrium going on there okay and it sounds very logical um if you want to think about it from a philosophical perspective but Actually, biologically, it's just your body trying to create equilibrium there. So it's very important to have this equilibrium word. Now, again, the typical uh, old school word, uh, you know, neural network, does not at all give us that depth of understanding of what's going on, does it? So this is why I believe this acquisition hyphen equilibrium, uh, these two words in the middle are very important. Now, the last word, of course, is network, and this is inevitable. It, we are talking about neural networks, so it, yeah, network has to um, be tagged on at the back. So the, the acronym that I have coined here is a DAN. It's pronounced DAN. And um, it stands for Dynamic Acquisition Equilibrium Network. And as teachers, if we keep this in mind, okay, if we realize that uh, we're teaching to expand all our students' DANs, Okay, and it's their dance that are picking up the learning. I think the way we start teaching them will change. Okay, it's specifically your dance that are reacting to my voice and the slides that are in front of you right now. Right? So let's look at the next slide. Uh, what I'd like you to do uh, is uh, pause this video um, and then. Yeah, you should probably take a stretch. It's been a while. Uh, you know, move your legs. Um, and then once you're rested, I'd like you to um, take a look at how my acronym DAN relates to this trielemental um, model that I had here, the, this trielemental mind map that I've created. Um, I'll just give you a hint. Um, some of you may remember what we had discussed on that Friday, but as your students and you create a map like this, okay, the map that's on the paper 
is becoming stimulation that goes to the brain and it's affecting your dance upstairs okay and your dance of course are creating newer connections and they're forcing your body to write new words and so you're creating an equilibrium between the paper and your brain and so this interaction is interestingly highly motivating for most students once they start to get it it's fun because uh, what they see on the paper makes more and more sense as the maps pan out and then uh, the more more equilibrium kicks in and then you know you start you or your student starts feeling a lot smarter just because they have this huge map in front of them and they start to make new connections that uh, they hadn't realized before and once the new new connections start kicking in there's a lot of creativity and um, although I haven't done specific EEG tests or fMRI tests using my specific paper here you know my specific mind map I'm quite sure from the science that I have read that um, endorphins, serotonin, um, all kinds of positive, like dopamine, all kinds of uh, positive neurotransmitters, all kinds of positive chemicals are probably flooding the brain uh, as they do this if they're enjoying it. Okay, And that's a great way uh, to teach, isn't it? To, have to make sure the students enjoy it. So um, again, pause here and think about this. And, uh, and how this how this all relates okay um, I hope you had a little pause and you had a time to think and uh, you had time to look at um, the forum perhaps and, and maybe do some typing in there uh, if not please go to the forum and and do type some some of your ideas up uh, share your ideas with each other and make sure your dance are affecting each other now the next slide, we're going to move on to dynamic skill theory. And of course, this is Kurt Fischer's work. Um, but he's a neo Piagetian uh, or Piagetian, some people say. Um, he took Piaget's work to a whole other level. And his work really makes sense. And I really think it should be center stage uh, in teacher training. And it currently isn't. And there are a few reasons for that. I think the biggest reason, though, is that it's difficult to grasp. It takes a long time to really understand what's going on here. But once you get it, um, it just makes so much sense. And it should start affecting your own teaching. Now, the problem is, though, again, even if you get it, it takes a long time for you to persuade your peers okay, about the benefits of, of understanding dynamic skill theory. And I think that's one of the main reasons um, for skill theory not being so popular amongst, you know, am among the regular pedagogy manual manuals and stuff like that. But for new or ELT, it is center stage. And so uh, whenever I give an uh, extended talk about new or ELT, you're going to hear about dynamic skill theory because I think it's very important for all of us to understand and understand well. At the bottom of here, you see this baby. And when babies are born, you know, um, they're basically a ball of reflexes. They cannot think deeply at all. Okay? They're born pretty helpless, uh, other than these reflexes. They really are not aware in the way adults are aware of the world. Now, uh, let's look at uh, the tiers here, okay? And through immersion properties, okay, that are written at the top, um, the tiers advance. Now, the reflexes tier, each tier has four stages, right, as you recall. So the reflexes tier, R1, R2, R3, to R4, um, we go through very quickly, like zero to two months, okay? And that's a good thing. Um, but then we move on to actions. Now, what are actions? So the first level of actions, A1, is the same thing as R4, isn't it? 
So it's a system of system of act, uh, reflexes. So um, it's not only a system of reflexes, it's a system of system of reflexes. And once it gets that complicated, we're finally able to call it a singular action. Okay. And then, um, so from the ages of 2 to uh, 36 months, okay, babies learn to do different actions. So uh, like grasping something because you wanted to hold on to it, not, not just as a reflex, but I'm holding something for the sake of holding on to it. That would be a single action. And then um, connecting that with uh, maybe you wanted to be aggressive and you wanted to hit a table and you wanted to hit the next baby or something like that, right? So um, you'd be able to grasp that stick or whatever, or spoon, and then you can hit the table with that. Okay, consciously. Okay, so that's uh, two things going on there: consciously holding on to the the spoon, and then like wrapping the table. Okay, so th that's two actions going on there. So that would be an A two. And when you're only two to three to four months old, you know, being able to do these, you know, hold on to something and hitting something, that's the peak of your cognition. You're really tapping tapping all of your cognitive energy into that and, and it takes your whole uh, you know that's like the, the most impressive thing you could do at the time okay um, and then uh, you move on to a3 and finally a4 now interestingly a4 is the beginning of RP1 um, the representations tier and so this is when these actions start taking on representational meanings that is they start becoming words and concepts that can be used concretely by the child. This part is what's interesting for us uh, teachers, especially teachers of young children, obviously, right? Because this is when they start talking. And um, the, the ability to relate one item to another item is connecting them. That would be an RP2, right? So like a daddy is tall. Okay, the idea of tall and the idea of daddy or something like that. Or um, daddy and, and th that's daddy and that's mommy and they're together or something like that. And then you can start creating a system. So it goes from RP2 to RP3 and then a system of systems, um, which goes on to AB1. Abstraction. Abstractions start at the age of 10, okay, in optimal levels. Now, an abstraction is pretty much what you would typically think an abstraction is uh, in, in regular um, American English, or I'm sorry. In standard English um, an abstraction is the ability to think of something that is not really there and still be able to explain it fully okay the the, the capacity to have that in your head and, and think about something um, even something like love okay the ability to talk about that if you're younger if you're only like two years old or four years old then you don't have the capacity to understand love. I mean, somebody might hug you and you might feel lovey, but you, it's not something that's on board as an abstraction uh, that can be expressed through words until you're, you're, you know, 10 years or older, okay? Uh, now, some of you might object to this and say, wait, 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 that doesn't make sense. But yeah, um, we've done so many uh, types of experiments through the specific protocols and then, um, it, it's it's definitely true these um, we have these levels that are pretty much age and context dependent okay if you're in a high support context and but you're not old enough to to say to, to say something at level a b2 you you will not do that no matter how hard a teacher tries to get the student to talk at level a b2 they'll only be talking at a b1 but look totally satisfied their brains are not capable of computing at level AB2 yet, okay? I've, I have first-hand knowledge of this, and I've, I've done research in, on this, and uh, it's fascinating how this so mathematically, uh, just how it pans out so um, so correctly, and, and, and so uniformly, I should say, across so many different cultures around the world, as long as you're in a high support context. <coughs> we can find out where these um, peaks come, out, come in. And finally, we have principles at the end, okay? After you reach level uh, AB3, AB4, and you reach principle in specific context.
contexts that allow you to reach that level uh, at, after the age of 25. For most people in most domains, most contexts, will never reach the level uh, AB4P1. Um, it's it's um, unfortunate that most of our lives, uh, we won't be able to reach P1 or P2, whatever, levels uh, for most of the domains uh, we might attempt. Um, and it's, it's shocking for some people to, to realize that, oh my god, I'm not going to be able to reach P1 in everything I try. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of disappointing to think about it in that way. Um, but, you know, if you turn it around, you know, you think about the things you excel in, okay? Um, you're not going to be able to excel in everything, but the few things you do excel in, you do a whole lot better than the other things, right? And that, that's what makes those few things shine, okay? So rather than being depressed about the fact that you can't shine in everything, I think the better way to think about it is humans have the ability to shine in a few select areas that they have um, been lucky enough to, to, to have enough high support uh, to, you know, to gain that uh, shininess. Um, and as teachers, we have to realize that students go through these stages. And uh, it's, it would be very interesting to come up with, uh, for, for every teacher to come up with, you know, their own syllabus designs that match uh, age and context uh, appropriateness as designed, as, as specified here in the skill theory. Okay. Um, I create my own textbooks that uh, I think are age and context appropriate for my own students. I think most students, uh, most teachers will be able to do that once they grasp, you know, the, um, the ins and outs of dynamic skill theory. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, so the key concepts that I talked about uh, today are cream, okay, consciousness raising, emotions analysis, Manipulation and expansion, right? Cream, that's the acronym of a pedagogy that takes us through these stages, uh, creates a high support context, okay? Based on skill theory. So uh, this is a kind of a, a quick and dirty way to make sure you, 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 know, you incorporate key concepts from skill theory into your teaching. As long as you follow uh, cream as a pedagogy, yeah, you do fairly well, I, I believe. Um, I've heard a lot of good things about teachers that have been using cream, maybe trying to incorporate cream into their own um, daily teaching styles. Uh, DATC uh, stands for uh, Dynamic Area of Total Convergence, okay? It's making sure the students, uh, uh, language students, get their proper dosages of linguistic knowledge along with their emotional and um, emotional manifestation and gestures that are appropriate with those ling with those linguistic features, and then the socio-cultural manifestations that are appropriate with those linguistic features. Make sure all three of these areas are connected uh, in the classroom, and hopefully they will connect uh, in the brain. Okay. For each of the students, the next acronym is DAN, Dynamic Area. Uh, sorry, not <laughs> Dynamic Area, um, Dynamic Acquisition Equilibrium Network. Dynamic Acquisition Equilibrium Network. This is the acronym that I use in place of uh, just neural networks because, as I said so many times, neural network on its own does not convey uh, how great the, uh, the... It doesn't convey the, um, the magic that's going on in the brain. Um, and it's really not good for teachers. Okay, uh, I feel this acronym, okay, Dynamic Acquisition Equilibrium Network, if a teacher sets out to understand what this acquisition part means, what this equilibrium part means, okay, and what, what's so dynamic about it, if a teacher sets out to understand the meaning that, a, uh, that uh, this acronym conveys, I really think it would have to affect their teaching because they start realizing that they're teaching to the students' dance. The students' dance are what have to uh, 
uh, grow. Okay. Um, and that certainly connects to, of course, dynamic skill theory itself and uh, the teachers who understand the different tiers and how we create mappings and, and uh, systems and system of systems and then go on to the next tier. By understanding that connection, again, teachers uh, teaching skills should vastly improve. Okay, and they'll be able to look at teach uh, students and look at their growth and uh, in very different ways and be, start being able to assess their students in very different ways. Okay, so I'd like you to stop this video one more time here and um, look here. It says, in the forum, briefly write about each of these terms. Specifically discuss how they could, should relate to your teaching. Shouldn't be a question mark at the end of that, should there? Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, we'll stop here and then please go to the forum and then uh, do some write-ups. And when you feel comfortable, please come back.